Don't want to talk about sex or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Are we rolling? Yes, we oh, are yeah, rolling. Oh my God. Welcome back. This is the <laughs> video number three of the video series about the career of my friend, Dr. Malcolm Sanford. Uh, and today is different. The video number one, we talk about his book. In the video number two, we talk about his website. And today, I want to pick his brain to discuss some issues, I would say. Issues? Or not issues. Uh, how about a little historical, uh, historical, uh, historical, kind of historical of ideas of beekeeping? Uh, yeah, what have yeah, changed? What, yeah, what I want to see uh, where do you think we're going with beekeeping uh, today? Well, it's a good question. Uh, if I had the answer, I'd probably be a millionaire, but I don't have the answer. So okay. we'll, have to, Let's we'll, try. Have, we'll try to figure it out together where we're going, you know, where we've been. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I think most people know about the general history of beekeeping. It's in my book a little bit about uh, Story's Guide to Keeping Honeybees. Uh, I at the, at the right now available, and in that uh, we we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the the major historical aspects of beekeeping. Um, and of course, uh, the biggest one in the United States is the 1850s, 1851, with uh, L.L. Langstroth. L.L. Langstroth developing. Uh, the movable frame hive. That was a game changer. That was a game changer. But you know, one of the aspects is there were other people that were developing the same kind of hive elsewhere in the world. I'm aware and, of that. Uh, and so he, even though we're giving him, because we're in the United States, we're giving him the credit a lot of times, other people helped with that and uh, assisted him. But he's the one that had the aha moment, right? Where- uh, I'm glad <laughs> that you mentioned the uh, others because it's something that I always bring when I'm thinking and talking about that about people, it's, it's not a one-man job. No, it is not a one-man deal. It's not a one-man no, job. No, that's right, that's right. Now, what he did do, I think, maybe was uh, make it more economical, and so he was mm -hmm. more concerned about economics than other people, yeah, But maybe. I think you put it in the right way, the aha part. <laughs> yeah, was well, the aha. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, apocryphal story is he ran up and down, uh, he, he was sort of, he, we, we now know that he might have been uh, bi bipolar, Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it might have been that this time came and he just decided. And so the, the apocryphal story, anyways, he was running up and down the, uh, the road saying, Aha! Aha! <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the old aha moment came all about. <laughs> that came together with very important new knowledge about the right. biology. Right, the exactly. Bee space. Bee space, whole concept, whole concept of. Uh, of, of how to how to move boxes and be able to manage the bees because in the, before that you couldn't you basically had to kill the bees kill the bees nobody yeah. want no beekeeper wants to kill bees so that's that was really that was really a game changer I think that's no the, question the about biggest that. change before you have hives and to have you know to get things from the hives right. you yeah. need to yeah. kill it. you yeah. need to destroy right. It. right 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 and after that yeah you manage them right. they change right. and that me, was, yeah, but the, but the question it, was that a good thing well, like so many things, <laughs> there were good parts and, and there are bad parts, the pros and cons about the whole thing. So, uh, and that's one of the things that's interesting, the vertical system, mm -hmm. the, the vertical hive system was what you know, came out of that, that practice and that research over the years, and what people now look at as beekeeping in boxes, vertically boxes that go up and down, right? Yep. Now we now know that uh, for pe beekeepers, that's great. But for honeybees, not so not necessarily so great true. because that breakup of the box, the breakup of the nest, there's some perturbations there that cause problems for bees. The beekeepers need it because you need to have the boxes separate. But that separation there is, is an issue. So right now we're having, uh, the, one of the big changes in beekeeping is going away from the vertical system looking at the horizontal system, where you don't have that break in oh, the nest, you're, in the you're, nest. You're mentioning your top you're, hive? Yeah, top, top, bar top bar hives, or the horizontal, European horizontal hive, which uh, basically expands outward this way, and so you don't have that break in the in situation. You still use some of the same supers and all the rest of it, but the brood nest remains the same. It's a large, deeper thing. Uh, the the Layens hive, uh, other hives like that. So that's... Uh, that's one of the one of the big changes right now is people are looking at different models 
for keeping bees rather than the standard, and that's the standard hive, the vertical system. But anyway, so that was Langstroth. He, 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 over years, he developed that, and we had this standard hive. So anybody that gets into beekeeping now, first thing they do generally, or first thing people tell them, yep. is get into this vertical system because that is most economical, so we have most information about it, and it's worked very well for a lot of beekeepers for many, many years. So it is worthwhile to consider that uh, vertical management, and then you move into the other management style if you're interested. But you need that base, and the base really in the United States is the vertical system. Uh, the vertical hives developed from the Langstroth bee space and the whole concept of that. So, so the changes then that occurred after that in the, in the 1880s and so on, I guess, I'm not exactly sure of the dates, but the golden age of beekeeping. Have you heard of that? No, I didn't know. Yeah, the golden age of beekeeping was when... Uh, golden age uh, here in the United yeah, States? Yeah, we're talking about here in the United okay. States, okay. The golden age was when the bees were introduced. Now, we know that the honeybee is not a native species to the United States. No. Introduced by the Spanish, probably, maybe out of Cuba, maybe out of Hispaniola. So we don't know exactly. But anyway, the bees came to uh, uh, the East Coast. And then, uh, like any introduced species, they were invasive. Yep. <laughs> we, can't, we can't ignore that. The fact is, hey, they came to the, people were invasive too. They came to the new land, they saw all the new uh, possibilities, and they just went crackers and they went bananas. And the bees, apparently, uh, the, maybe an apocryphal story, but nevertheless, the bees preceded the Western expansion of humans. They were the first ones to show up in the indigenous lands mm -hmm. before the white man came. And the indigenous people then called them at that point the white man's, man's fly. The white they thought it was a fly. fly. The white man's fly. We didn't realize it, they didn't realize it was a bee. So the white man's fly proceeded. And presumably the idea was oh, if you get the fly, you got problems because here come the white men behind the fly. <laughs> oh, so, and that's so, a big change. You, you big see, change. You there. see that fly run? <laughs> well, we don't know, but anyway, that's the that was the idea. So, as when the bees expanded across the uh, the continent, honey then became the big uh, prize from honeybees. And how are you going to? One of the nice, uh, interesting things at that time: no refrigeration. Right. Yep. So, uh, what with honey? Honey's good. You don't for need you don't refrigeration, need. Yep. right? Okay. So, as a consequence, you could ship honey all around. They were probably boxcar loads of the stuff going to New York and places like that. And people were eating it out of the comb. It was not extracted into jars, but they were eating it out of the comb. And uh, one of the ideas behind that, interestingly enough, possibly the concept that that if it's in the comb, it's real honey. It's not adulterated. Adulterated. It's not fake honey. It's real honey. How do you know it's real honey? It's in the comb. <laughs> Nobody, you know, people can make fake honey or, or it is honey, but they can't, they can't make comb. <laughs> and they can't put honey in the comb. Nobody's going to do that. So that shows that was the real. So then the comb, what's called the, the, the beekeeping, uh, the section comb honey. Section comb meaning that actually uh, the hive was the supers were divided into sections, little squares, and the bees built comb in those squares and deposited honey in those squares. The honey was capped over and they sold the squares. Yeah, those are called sections. I, 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 that was in the that was still a lot of tradition. And yeah, so you can still you can still find some of that. It's not easy, but I you can saw still a lot find of that some. In Turkey, when I Turkey, was yes. Uh, other places will have section honey, and that was a whole art form, the section honey situation, uh, to get a correct, you know, without having you get a nice looking comb, nice presentation, put it in a package, and ship it out the door right to people, and they knew it was real. No. They didn't have a problem with the uh, idea that well, it might not be real. So that was the kind of the golden age of, uh, of honey. And then the extraction. Extraction came along, taking the, comb, the honey out of the comb, putting it into jars, and selling the liquid. And uh, that 
was probably the next big big change that came along and because uh, of the, the you could tell adulteration in, in for chemical analysis and other reasons and so on so it wasn't as big a problem as it was previously where nobody knew it was real honey or not you know pretty much now that's well, most of it's real not every all of it there's still a lot, a lot going on with that but that was a big change so section honey to extracted honey and um, and then that for a long time that was the thing honey was the uh, the uh, basic product for beehives uh, until uh, pollination came along yep. we already talked about that in previous, uh, previous. videos yeah. about the concept of pollination uh, and uh, and then even part of pollination which is the almond pollination which is now occurring in California so as a consequence uh, that has been a big shift and that's the, the economic driving force now of uh, honeybees, honeybee keeping, is pollination, a little bit of honey. Sure, honey's still important, but, but the pollination is the, is the major thing. So along with those changes then, those are the changes in, in how the, the craft has adapted over the years, then we have the other changes that occurred, uh, which would be the changes in pests and predators and other kinds of organisms that are affecting honeybees. And of course the traditional disease that everybody knows about or should know about at least is something called American fowl brood. And we know that's a spore forming bacterium. And that spore, that's the key issue. The spore, the spore will live in honey, it won't live in honey, it will exist in honey. Now when you, and then when the spore is always looking for a place to germinate, and the, the where it's going to germinate is in the bee's gut. And when you get too many spores in the bee's gut for American fowl brood, you got the actual disease, which is a real killer for bees. And for beekeepers too, considered to be a really a, a, com, a complete devastation over a long, wide period of, uh, of geographic space. So in the United States, that's where bee inspection came from. That was a big change. There was no bee inspection before that, but bee inspection was then to, in the 20s, 1920s, around that area. To try was, to uh, stop that, American the thing, fowl brood. If you look at most beekeeping associations and state beekeeping uh, inspection pr uh, procedures, those all started about that time, about 1920 or so. And it was all about American fowl brood. That was really what it was all about. So that continued up until uh, then we started to get, uh, well, there's another fowl brood, European fowl brood. European fowl brood, not, not as, as bad a situation as American fowl brood. Uh, no, yep, but it's increasing right yeah, now. But another big change, yes. coming. get ready, because yeah, now we're seeing it's, some European fowl brood that's a little bit different. And so that's some, gonna be one of the changes that we're seeing as time goes on that we talk about. Some evidences that. right now that people, what the people call the crud, yeah, the crud. It yeah, might be yeah. a different European fowl brood. Well, it might be, absolutely. A there is kind of fowl fowl some brood. evidence yeah, yeah, yeah. coming up with that. I have a question, Professor. Yeah. I wanna, something that is unique of the United States. I want your thoughts on that. It's the only place on earth that I know. I visit a lot of countries with beekeeping in my life. But here's the only place that 90% of the colonies are controlled by 5% of the beekeepers. Your thoughts on that? Uh, Ninety percent of the colonies, the bees, are, are managed, managed by five percent of, of beekeepers. The beekeepers. Uh, uh, what do you think led to that? There's a lot of commercial uh, operational profit. Yeah, but there's, profit. there's probably one thing that led to that: transportation of bees in trucks. Yeah. Or, but the system uh, is still every everything's the same, but the transportation is different. So one guy could manage a lot more bee, co bee colonies because of the transportation. So that's what led to uh, this, maybe this concentration we're talking about. It's a, it, I, I see that it's a management problem. How can you manage, manage so many bees? Let me tell you a, a, a story, okay? All right. <laughs> story. Uh, uh, you can tell I'm, all the I'm, story, I'm, nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> a large beekeeper, I went to a meeting, a large beekeeper was talking about uh, we were talking, he was talking about honeybees. He managed thousands of colonies, this guy, okay? And he was talking about bee, having bee, the bee uh, issues with diseases and so on. And people were talking about, what do you do for this? And what do you do with that? And how do you do this? And how do you do that? And finally, popped out of his mouth. 
He says, you know, I really like all this discussion about honeybee health. And it wasn't even honeybee health at that time. It was just like just hunt, keeping honeybees. He says, but you know, I, I'm kind of sad. And I go, what are, you, what are you sad about? You're sad about keeping bees? He says, no, you know, I'm just sad because I only move boxes. That is his strategy, <laughs> and that's why I come back to transportation. He moved boxes. He moved, he moved, and that's what a lot of people are doing. They're just moving boxes, and they're not real beekeepers in that sense, but they're making it, making it work for them. Yeah, economically, yeah, yeah. they put the yeah. numbers together yeah. with the moving that's box. That's right. And, and how do you move? Works. You move in a truck, and I had move boxes by trucks, and so that's I think that was a big game changer. That's true. Yeah. And of course, that had to do with our infrastructure as well. You got to build a road, right? If you got a truck and you got no road, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have that kind of thing. That's a lot, of, a lot of reasons with our with, with our transportation system set up to move a lot of things on trucks. Too many bees and in bees one spot. Yeah. Too. That yeah. Facilitate right. diseases. Right. Exactly. Facilitate diseases. All kinds of things. So that that was one of the big changes, I think, is the facility to move bees on trucks continues today. And uh, it, it continues to be an issue because uh, here in Florida, for example, um, lots of interesting stories about people that move bees on trucks into Florida and didn't tell anybody. And their bees are on the side of the road and they're, uh, they're foraging and people say, wait a minute, what's going on with these bees? And uh, we're going to complain, you know, and then in rural Florida, nobody complains. People act. Act. <laughs> Yeah. So well, there's a, uh, there's another apocryphal story about the Florida Panhandle where you got a lot of, a lot of rural people and you know they're a little bit uh, you know they don't they're acting and so the the apocryphal story was a guy called up from South Florida because he moved his bees into the Panhandle. He said, "What about my bees up there? How are they doing?" <laughs> guy in the on the phone says, "You know what? You better come up and pick up your nails." <laughs> I that was that. all that was left. They yeah. burned every colony that guy had. I believe. And the nails were the only <laughs> the thing only left. Thing left. <laughs> With the nails. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's the kind of thing that can uh, happen. Yeah. So, yeah. I believe uh, that. I'm working, <laughs> I'm traveling a lot at yeah. the University of uh, the state of Florida, and then I, I have yeah. my own stories. Yeah, yeah, I have your own stories about it. I that. have anyway, my own yeah. stories. <laughs> where Problems with the moving, all, where we're we going here. Well, we don't really know. Uh, that's that's the that's the aspect. So we're looking at kind of, a, are we going to move more bees or not? We might have reached a uh, a point where moving bees is no longer economic. It may not no, no longer make economic sense. A lot of new. I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, we we don't know because of the uh, all the. The new technology and stuff. It may be that new uh, that can yeah, yeah, adjust yeah. temperature. And if we and get an introduced uh, pest, we could talk about the. You have a, you have a video about that introduced pest mm -hmm. as possible. Tropolilaps, oh, tropolilaps, clara, tropolilaps from the Asia. If you there'll get that, be a, be there may hit. there not may not be a, uh, there may be a big shift there in terms of trying to move bees on trucks. It may not be able to happen. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, tropical yeah. lapse is going to be a problem. Well, we, we think it's a problem. We we, we sure don't want anybody introducing the darn thing. No. But nevertheless, there, there we are. So, and that's another thing we lead to, is that there's consistent change. So you have the American fowl brood, you have the European fowl brood, you have Nosema. Now we can talk about Nosema. Talk about Nosema. Nosema shifted. Yep. For years it was Nosema apis. That was the Nosema. It was a diuretic. Uh, the bees had diarrhea, and they, they spotted around, and they they couldn't they couldn't defecate, and they had all kinds of gut problems and whatever else. And so this was the concept for Nosema, generally in the northern part of the United States, where bees couldn't get out and, and defecate because they were stuck all year yep. long. I mean, all winter, winter, winter long winter. in the thing. In the south, wasn't as big a problem because bees could fly on occasion, defecate. But, and, and, to, and then, of course, we got a new nap, a new, new species, no, Nosema. Nosema serrana. <laughs> serrana. Now, where did that come from? We don't even know. Mm -hmm. And uh, now some people realize it's been around a long time. And it, it, we now know that it has completely displaced, in most many areas, Nosema apis. Yeah, we can't find that anymore. It's, right, no uh, Nosema apis, yep. but no, now we got I Nosema serrana. Uh, 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 I keep looking. 
And it's a different disease, it's a different etiology, a different whole kind of concept. And, uh, and, and so uh, that's part of the change that's happening now. As far as I know, there's no real treatment well, for the, that at the present well, time. No, at the present time, the fumagillin, fumagillin, fumagillin was, for, was for the other, but the, I'm not sure production. it's... They stopped production after to start with, yeah. No, but not, so I don't think there's really any, any, uh, a any treatment issue. for that. It's a big issue right now. Yeah. That's a big, big change. And of course, now some other things that happened, you know, as when, during my career, in the middle of my career, of course, we got the tracheal mite, you know. And so the tracheal mite came in in 1984 into Texas. And uh, as a consequence, uh, it has uh, it moved into the United States. And by the time we realized there was a, it was actually introduced, it was too late to really do anything in terms of uh, trying to keep it in, in abeyance. And so basically the whole country was just opened up to tracheal mite. And even got, finally got to Canada. They had it out for a while, but, uh, but now tracheal mite is not so much of a problem in the south as it is in the north. Uh, again, because of the wintering situation and things like that, it's a little bit of a different situation. But uh, that was considered to be a real, real game changer. And uh, once they got tracheal mite, of course, then Canada closed the border. Oh, yeah. can you imagine the mess? <laughs> yeah. Now that's another change that happened. Uh, the beekeeping industry People had the, 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 about the, borders, well. There's no. another another whole industry of beekeeping, which is the beekeeping of producing queens and package bees. Yeah, and ship live and shipping them on trucks. Live uh, animals. Shipping those live animals somewhere else. And the Canadian uh, model, when I got into beekeeping, the Canadian model was clear. It would have been that, like that for years. What, they, what happened is the Canadians would have their bees, they would make honey in the summer. And Canada makes a lot of honey. Why is that? Well, that's because the days are long. In the high latitudes, you've got a very long day. So bees can operate all through a very long day on these crops, and they can make a lot of honey, a tremendous amount of honey. Now, when the fall comes, bees have to drop down, and then you got to manage them, and you got to feed them back, and you got to worry about them, and whatever. Well, the model was, what was the model? Kill them. Mm. Kill those bees in the fall in Canada. Well, what, he can't do that. We won't have any bees in the springtime. Well, guess where you got your bees in the springtime? Mm -hmm. In the southern part of the United States, where people develop what's known as the package bee industry. Package bee. And they just ship packages up to Canada, put them in the spring, got their big honey flows, killed them in the yard, and they were gone. And then they're yep. back. Until these, until the uh, this tracheal mite, acra, acra, apis, wood eye, this. and then the, the varroa mite, you know, varroa destructor came in, both of those. That was it. Those were game changers, and the Canadians said, "Hey, wait a minute! We're closing the border. No more. <laughs> you can't do this no anymore. More anymore." And the and the and the beekeepers again said, "Wait a minute! What are we going to do? I mean, this <laughs> extra bees. do something." So <laughs> so they started raising their own queens and producing bees and not killing their bees in the, in the fall like they were in the past, and that's been going on now for a long time. And that is the model because the border is still shut. Still? No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still, it's still shut. shut. That's yeah, true. Still shut. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was uh, these are some big changes that occurred. We still have package bees. Why is that now? Well, now we've got a whole different cadre of beekeepers that are beginning beekeepers. They want package bees, so Easy they're simple. buying package bees from these these producers, and uh, so the backyard bee, 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 backyard bee, uh, lots of different reasons, and maybe to produce you know for to introduce create bees uh, for putting them on trucks and shipping them to California, whatever. But anyway, the point is, we still have a packaged bee industry and a queen industry uh, that, uh, that, and apparently uh, any queen that can be produced in the United States will be bought. Yep. There's a I mean, there's no question. hot market. There's is. a very hot market for bees, uh, queens. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is a big demand and you can't. And that's a little bit different than it was because in the past they probably had to kind of you know, hunt around to see who's going to buy my queens and so on. You don't have to worry about that. Not anymore. And what that also brings into focus is the uh, genetics. 
you know, are there, you know, what programs are available for uh, looking at actual genetics for bees and how uh, we know how to manage the genetics. Most package bee breeder, breeder are not, they're, they're breeding queens from their local stock. From their local yeah, habitat. Which they have to have in a way because the habitat works for them at that local stock mm -hmm. level. But if you ship them, you know, 300 miles somewhere else, it may not work there. So those bees may not work there. And so that's part of the issue. But if you can sell every queen you have mm -hmm. without doing anything extra, I'll sell it to you. Yep. I'll, I'll sell that queen to you. Yep. And you'll ask and me I'll, what, where did it come from? I said, I don't care. And I'm probably going to take it. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, something's gonna yeah, happen yeah, and I'm gonna yeah, make up a story. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, something yeah. happened here and then yeah. this. Oh, new story right, come yeah, up. And right. And so that's one of the things, that, that's the last little key to be in place for um, uh, the honeybee as a domestic animal, is actually being able to uh, have some kind of a defined uh, breeding program. We don't have that except there's one. There's one defined breeding program in the United States. The, That's the Russian program. The Russian program. The Russian program is the only one. That's right. And so, to me, that's one of the interesting things that there are people that are involved in that Russian program. Uh, it has problems maybe because it's Russian. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's the wrong name. <laughs> yeah, we need to change the name. It's marketing. Yeah, it's a marketing issue, maybe, yeah. you know. And so, you know, maybe we should call them something else, you know. And and there are some other names that are possible. But right now, when you call them Russians, eh, some people, well, I'm not going to buy any Russian queens. Forget about it, you know, kind of thing. But it turns out the Russian queens are pretty much uh, in this, in this uh, pretty much tolerant to a good degree to varroa mites. And so it's worth, some people are really having a good, good, uh, By the a way, good treatment. By the way, video coming soon about the Russian bees, so. <laughs> so another video no, coming. Oh yeah, okay. that's, that's what I do now. <laughs> that's what you're doing. Well, I, and a lot of videos, by the way. We could talk about the uh, evolution of videos. Yeah. And Humberto's, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, really. I mean, there's some stuff going on there that, that people need to look at if you want to look at this channel. There's some lot of innovative stuff there. And uh, so that's that's part of uh, shifting too. By the way, this information, how you get your information, whatever else, how you're going to yeah. do that. Yeah, there is a, a lot of information uh, right, out right. there. It's a lot more information than used to be, and some of it's good, but some of it's not. And you have to kind of determine what what's going to be your best best source and how it's going to operate for you. All right. So, what else changed? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, so many things have changed. So. Yeah, yeah. I think you really wanted me to kind of prognosticate the future, but I, I'm not uh, going to do that. I try. <laughs> I am trying. Not, I, <laughs> he would like to have somebody do I'm that. Not, but I'm yeah. not optimistic. In that. You're not. No, I'm not. Well, not, well I, now, now wait a minute. That's been the beekeeper's mantra for years nah. to be optimistic. I'm, I'm a and rational you're, person. Uh, <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> Are you saying you're not a beekeeper? Now that's a different thing. Well, that's <laughs> true. Maybe I'm in the middle yeah, of that. Yeah, you might be in the middle, yeah. I think everybody, I think, is, is a beekeeper to some degree or would like to be. But then, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, there's no way to really prognosticate the future. And uh, the biggest issue in, in general, I think, in the environment is the uh, acceleration of change. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the change so much as the acceleration of it. And something that was a small change, we don't have a, a period. All of a sudden, becomes a is... the small change then becomes something that's a big change, like there. So it grows very quickly, and it's that it's that rapid, you know, the the curve that goes up and up and up and up kind of thing until it crashes down. So that's part of the, uh, the big shifting change is the, the the pace of change. We just can't keep up. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. I'm I'm not super. Now that might be why you're uh, you're. You know, you, you feel like you you do maybe that you just can't keep. I can't keep up. I know that. I mean, but too much there, information. Too we, much we don't have a specialists anymore because once you think you know something, it already changed. <laughs> and you don't. You don't well, have that's, a specialist. That's right. Anymore. The specialist situation is is, 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 is an issue. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not that. Con I'm not sure if I'm concerned about it. 
Apes mellifera, the honeybees. I think I'm more concerned about the other pollinators because they're going. Ah, now that's a whole other. That's another a whole other discussion. Yeah, because Absolutely. the bees, we yeah. keep the bees, right. and we produce, we reproduce yeah, them. They're uh, not going to go anywhere. Let's let's talk about that. The the extinction of the honeybee ain't going to happen. No. Now why is that? No, we 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 are. Why is it not going to happen? Because are. people are going to keep those keep bees around. Bees. Yeah. Now. Bumblebees, maybe mm. not. But uh, this, uh, you know, some kind of bee out in the woods here. All other bees. Uh, who cares? Yeah. You know, I mean, nobody gives a darn about them, and they're the ones that are probably at greater risk. I think you're right about that. It isn't. Uh, but we don't even know half of them. You yeah. know, we, we are, there's we estimated to be 20,000 species of bees sitting around here, and we're looking at one species. Yep. Apis mellifera. That's it. And, and they're pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty tough, They're but pretty uh, tough. but but they have a co human constituency. That's the most important thing. Yeah, just like dogs. Humans are not <laughs> going to let them go away without a fight. Yep. But these other insects, eh, eh. Nobody. What? Can. Forget about yeah. it. Well, you may. Well, well, you, we may rue the day we said that. You're gonna regret. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, uh, we've been a long time at this, uh, so uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next video. Yeah, we think we are <laughs> we're done for today. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> next month, maybe. Next month. <laughs> bye -bye. <laughs> Inside the Hive.TV, the show will be. Bye-bye.